we didn't put them on a training course. But what we said was, these two Rhino Rangers will go with this team. Leslie's team, he will train the guys. Skills transfer, we call it. So the, the origins of the Conservancy Rhino Ranger program really sort of resides in the, in the recognition um, in a number of trends that seem to be emerging uh, back about a decade ago, about 2010. And this was before any of the poaching had reached Namibia, although we had been catching wind of everything, obviously, in South Africa. We had our first security meeting with South Africans. You know, up until then, you know, rhino protection in, in Canada especially was largely an NGO-driven activity led primarily by Save the Rhino Trust, which worked under a, a mandate from the Ministry of Environment to, to monitor the region's rhino. And what we knew as a Save the Rhino was that we did not have the manpower at, at the time to, 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 to withstand this, this new threat of, of, of poaching. And we need to, to be creative um, in our thinking to come up with a new way of moving forward if we were going to combat um, the poaching crisis. How is the Rhino Rangers different from Save the Rhino Trust? Okay, me and Jeff again actually came up with the idea. So Jeff is your scientific... Yeah, he's my scientific advisor. Yes. So, and, and we said, why, why don't we carry on with this thing? You try and raise some funding, and I will put everything in place, because, I mean, I have so much of a say, and I'm a partner with, with, with the government and the conservancies. So we draw up a, a, a MOU with the conservancies, and we tell them, look, we will want two guys from each Rhino Custodian Conservancy. At that time, there were, I think, 14. Yes. Yeah, there were 14 that signed agreements. Because when we put the Rhinos into the conservancies, we, um, they signed agreements with the government that say it's, it will, they will be looking after the Rhinos. And I signed a, also an MOU with them to say it, that I will back you up. And I had an agreement with the government that says they give us the responsibility due to all the training, tourism and, and everything in, in, in the Northwest region with rhinos and report directly back to the government and send all the IDs and stuff that we had to the government. We saw this huge opportunity that was really just waiting and the question was, was willing, was to work with the local communities much more. And through the conservancy model, there was the obvious opportunity here to, to engage and, and empower a lot more, particularly for rhino protection. In 2011, we had our first uh, focused security meeting, Rhino security meeting in, in Kunani, and everybody was present. It was called and chaired by the ministry, did a great job bringing everyone together. A lot of this was sort of under their communal uh, Rhino custodianship program, which had been running for a number of years already. And what was so fortuitous at that meeting and which came out so loud and clear was that the community representation, which was a number of conservancy leadership that was there um, in attendance, you know, rather than standing back and asking for NGOs and the government to take the lead and to, to protect, the, you know, the government's rhinos, they stood up, literally stood up in the meeting and said, no, you know, they want us, the NGOs and government, to rather build capacity within their own institutions to look after their rhino. And this was, to me at least, you know, the, the real uh, turning point um, and, and the light bulb moment, so to speak, that, that we have this great opportunity here and, and we, need to, we need to grab it now. So we actually started there and uh, we talked to the conservancies. Some conservancies has, 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 has game guards that they employed and they said, okay, these two game guards can just work over to the Rhino Ranger program. And others employed some guys. They pay them a salary. We give them the field day bonuses, the Rhino siding bonuses, rations, 
uh, uniforms. The first sort of step in this process was really to review and try and learn, you know, what what is the current state of affairs. And what we learned was that, you know, there are a lot of things that have to accompany, you know, skills in order for an activity, a specialist activity such as rhino monitoring to enable that to take place. Nothing too complicated, but things like equipment. The guys need and need to maintain good equipment, and that's to be in the field. There needs to be tents, they need to have boots, they need to have uniforms, they need to have GPSs and cameras, all this stuff. We didn't put them on a training course, but what we said was, these two rhino rangers will go with this team, Leslie's team. He will train the guys, skills transfer, we call it. And they need to have transport. A lot of the rangers lived, you know, far away from where the rhinos actually were, and you can't expect them uh, to walk there to go do their patrols. So all these things were very illuminating to learn, but they really presented a clear sort of roadmap to how to get this new program initiated. Save the Rhino Trust have really tried and tested this local level monitoring program for, for nearly 30 years. You know, Save the Rhino Trust are almost entirely made up of local community staff anyway. They were willing and, and ready to commit was to appoint and employ their own staff to be delivering this rhino protection and together the two parts, the incentives and the, the, the community um, leadership was was what formed the core of of this ranger program through this partnership this multi stakeholder partnership you know we were we were essentially you know creating something much bigger than any single one of us would be able to contribute um, with the teamwork element I have given them training on the scene of the crime how to handle a crime scene what to do, and also how to fill in a rhino ID monitoring form also complete. And, um, and then we give them certification. We said, you are now fit to do this. The program really came together through the series of what we called agreement letters, clarifying the roles and the responsibilities of the different partners, the different players. What were we offering to put on the table? What were the conservancies offering? And making sure that we all established, you know, these things that were around the shared goals of, of doing a better job looking after a rhino in a way that pulled in and I think harnessed, you know, the values um, the, that the local people might have um, for them. I mean, our, our overall goals really ended up becoming then, you know, how can we build this program that really improves the value that, that local people attach to saving rhinos? What's, what's so interesting and unique about this is that it's very different, fundamentally different than so many other rhino protection programs, which, you know, really sees poaching as the problem with the goals of, of essentially catching poachers and arresting poachers. And often when, when this is the way that you define the problem and your goals, um, sadly, a lot of the local people end up getting caught in the middle. Um, and rather victimized as part of the problem rather than the solution. So we really wanted to flip this on its head and not at all to argue that we we didn't need that we didn't need um, law enforcement. Law enforcement will be so much better. It'll be so much more effective and efficient and safer if they're protecting something that local people actually value, helping strengthen um, you know, rhino protection in, in, in many ways and the law enforcement that it obviously demands and requires. And that's how the Rhino Ranger program actually came up. Now it's around 60 people. But I mean, the more boots we had on the ground, the better. That's, that's what we thought. And, and with having them, the sidings have actually troubled. The field day bonus have troubled. Okay, we have to pay them field day, but they work for it. It's not that they just sit there and get it. And so, but the whole thing grow, but also the whole protection grows. And, and with that, I mean, we have so many people in, on the ground, it's, it's never enough. Yeah. But still, because the area is so big, it's about 25,000 square kilometers that we're talking about. And we try our best, and, and that's actually how the Rhino Rangers came up. They are directly under me, and Leslie, he is deploying them and do everything. Yes. But they work for the conservancies. Metrics that we use to sort of 
you know, evaluate our whether or not we're, we're achieving our goals. We certainly wanted to increase the number of boots on the ground. Um, and again, not just normal, any boots, but boots from the community. We wanted to increase income to the community because we know that that's important. That thing, rhino protection, is not cheap. It's expensive. We, we need to make sure that we have resources. And then also we wanted to see if these resources would be actually reinvested in rhino protection. Um, whether or not the community did feel empowered enough to, to to do this on their own, and I think you know the results speak for themselves. I mean, we've we've increased the patrolling effort since the program started by by twelvefold for one thousand two hundred percent over the past seven years. I mean, that's that's pretty astounding. The income to communities with about four or five new rhino tourism enterprises has also metastasized. Um, I think prior to COVID anyway, close to three and a half million Namibian dollars um, was generated uh, straight into conservancy bank accounts from rhino tourism alone. And what's most interesting is that if you follow that increase in income, you see almost the similar trend in the number of conservancy rangers that are appointed and employed. So indeed, the conservancies not only earned more income from rhino, but they clearly reinvested that as a valued asset uh, back into its protection, which which I think is is so important and and so amazing to see that level of voluntary investment. And I, I don't know uh, specifically, but I suspect that it's a pretty unique occurrence um, across Africa. With uh, Aldermate Safaris at Huap, they hold the conservancy in the hand, and, and that's one of the conservancies that was the I would say the poorest. They had nothing. They were only um, trophy hunting dependent. And now, uh, Aldermatch Safaris is, has taken over all the ranges that's there. They supplied with everything. Plus, through Aldermatch Safaris, tourists also buy uniforms and stuff for all the other guys, all the other rangers in other areas, not just WAP. So that is the Pack for Conservation? Pack for Conservation, sponsored, yeah, yeah, sponsored. And I mean, we had already had a lot of them that we give out to the guys which is really a great help to the conservancies. Uh, but also, like now, Ultimate Safaris have provided a vehicle that's doing the patrolling there in the area, and I don't have to send a vehicle there. I go there by myself every now and then just to check on the guys, just to show face, and there's also, there's always good control over there. So tourism is very important for Namibia, whether it comes to conservation, to community, wildlife. We also need to relook at our sustainable financing, um, and I think COVID and the tourism collapse uh, speaks to this. You know, we did place a lot of our hope in the fact that tourism was going to create these sustainable benefits that we'd be going back and not only keeping the program afloat, but also growing over the years um, and allowing us to expand. Well, um, we see where that's at now. So we need to revisit this and look at some other ways um, to diversify the financing mechanisms that we have to support the program. And there's already been some great initiatives. The Rhino Gold Bar is one that's already stepped up in this time of COVID. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that we might look at creating new mechanisms that would help support this program. We need to look at that.